Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, happy fourth. How the uh, illicit fireworks over on the Venice side of Los Angeles? I mean, it went all night over here. When we moved here, once it became summer, like there were just fireworks all the time. And people are like, oh, yeah, that's just what happens in Venice. People just set off fireworks all summer. It's like a thing over here. I, I know the problems with fireworks. I have a dog. She goes nuts. I know they're hard on some people. But as a kid, I was obsessed with fireworks, and I will always love them. And there's nothing I can do to stop that. Well, they do these, like, aerial shots of L.A. to just show the fireworks that are happening everywhere, you know, in addition to the yeah. massive fireworks show that they have. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely like people take Fourth of July seriously over here. Yeah, they take it real serious. Speaking of fireworks, got a lot of interesting stuff today. Uh, big development in the U.S.'s withdrawal from Afghanistan, some space news, uh, a couple of interesting stories out of China, how the Biden team is reportedly rethinking sanctions policy. And there's a growing financial crisis in Lebanon. The Saudi delegation visits D.C. And then we got some fun Olympic news. Okay, so let's start with this update out of Afghanistan, because... You know, last Friday, the United States military announced that it had completely withdrawn from Bagram Airfield, which is this massive, massive base and airfield 40 miles north of Kabul that has basically been the anchor of the U.S. war effort for years. According to The Washington Post, the departing American forces didn't tell the Afghan commander who was supposed to take over the command of the base that they were leaving until they had already left. And the power just went out, water stopped running, and then the U.S. troops were just gone. Pretty shocking, Ben, considering that the base was overrun uh, by looters and still includes a prison that holds about 5,000 prisoners. I think most of them are Taliban. So uh, abandoning Bagram is a big deal symbolically. It's also, again, just a massive facility. It's two huge runways, 100 parking spots for fighter jets, a small hospital, and just like tons and tons of stuff that's accumulated over the last 20 years. The Afghan commander said that the U.S. forces had left behind 3.5 million items. That's like from cars and trucks to water bottles to doorknobs, just everything in between. This all comes as the Taliban continues to take territory in northern Afghanistan. Uh, Reuters said that a quarter of Afghanistan's districts have fallen to the Taliban in recent weeks. The BBC reported that in recent days, more than 1,600 Afghan soldiers actually fled across the border into Tajikistan to escape uh, Taliban fighters, so things aren't going well. Ben, you know, the U.S. fully departing from Bagram, I think, really hammered home for me that there's just no going back on this decision. Yeah. What do you think the significance is of this uh, withdrawal? And what do you make of this decision by military leaders to like not tell the Afghan leaders who are, who are supposed to take over? Well, I think, first of all, it can't be underscored enough how much Bagram is, is the symbolic and operational home of the American war in Afghanistan. In, in a way that, I guess, in Iraq, it would have been the green zone. I mean, mm -hmm. Bagram is, everything runs through there. It's this massive base when we would go with Obama on kind of these secret visits in the middle of the night, that's where he'd go. And then he would, from there, hel helicopter into Kabul to meet with the president of Afghanistan. He addressed the nation from Bagram. I had to write an address to the nation he gave, literally from that military base. And it had the feel of like a city. You know, it, it had the kind of almost absurdity of, of, of how big of a thing the American military can build in the middle of a foreign country. Um, tens and tens and tens of thousands of people have flown flowed through there, served there. And, and, and when we were debating, Tommy, at the end of the Obama years, whether to remove all troops or to keep some, right, there was no some option that didn't anchor in Bagram. Like Bagram mm -hmm. might be the one base we could keep. So I think leaving Bagram is, is really the end of the American engagement in this war. I mean, that's what it felt like to a lot of us who've been involved with this over the years. There was a finale to that in part because you know, if you were ever going to return, like Bagram would be the place that you would you would want, want to have kept to, to do that. In terms of not telling the Afghans, look, it's shitty. I mean, I, I think it, it's, it's, I'm sure that here's the reasoning. I'm sure the reasoning is their overwhelming priority leaving is the security of the people leaving. And that there's, if there's any risk um, of that information getting out and people knowing our troop movements, that that could put them in danger. But that said, when we've been visiting guests in these in this country for this long, and this is like the hub of everything we do, you know, the the coordination around the handover of the biggest base is kind of a, also a symbol of of, of respect um, and investment in the future of Afghanistan. And and so, I understand you know the, the the rationales are always force protection. What can we do to minimize any risk to our troops? But it was it was not a good you know, not a good look, I think, to 
um, to not coordinate that. And obviously it also led to the looting and contributes, I think, to a sense in Afghanistan of like, wait a second, we're really, you know, kind of on our own here, um, which was inevitable when you decide to remove all troops, um, but doesn't make it any 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 less difficult to manage for, from the Afghan perspective. Yeah, I mean, the, the finality of some of these details, I mean, you know, sort of all these big heavy trucks that are getting left behind, but the U.S. forces are taking the keys because they don't want them like st- stripped or sold to, I don't know, whomever, or, or to be used by Taliban forces if somehow they got a hold of them. But yeah, I mean, there's going to be, a, a, I think, more and more and more stories like this that are really just going to hammer home the finality of the decision. And, you know, I think we all have to prepare ourselves for that's going to be there's going to be some really tough stuff. I mean, th- there's going to be districts that fall to the Taliban. There's going to be uh, incidents where the Afghan security forces just either don't fight or, or get defeated militarily. And I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of it. There's definitely echoes of Iraq in, in the end of 2011 when the U.S. Uh, withdrew from Iraq under Obama and then actually went back in uh, several years later because the security situation deteriorated and something I'm sure the Biden team's watching, and I saw Jen Psaki today talking about a you know the permanent diplomatic presence in Kabul and all these things they're going to try to do to sort of help the Afghans uh, take on this the entirety of this fight, but it's going to be tough. Yeah, I mean, and look, I think to to be fair to the Biden team, I think the challenge we're seeing are indictment of the twenty year war effort. Um, oh, absolutely, yes. And, and and what happens when you decide to go to war like this in the first place? Um, not like the just the decision to leave because. As we've sure. talked about, unless America was going to stay with massively more military force than 2,500 or 5,000 troops, this is the direction that things are going in Afghanistan in any event. Um, and what's so difficult is that this is so far from what we hoped when we went into Afghanistan, from what was promised when we went into places like Iraq and Afghanistan. This was going to happen unless, again, like America is willing to make a multi-decade commitment at a much higher level than a few thousand troops, which I don't think was politically possible. Um, So, like, as people watch this, I think um, you can find fault with the Biden decision if you want. You can criticize ways in which they've implemented it. But the overall circumstances, I think, are much more an indictment of of this entire policy choices that were made or not made during those 20 years. Or, frankly, just the limits of what a military can do. Like, the U.S. military can go to a foreign country and it can take some people out. And they took out al-Qaeda. They took out Osama bin Laden. But they can't necessarily go to another country and remake its politics. That, that has not worked. It didn't work in Iraq. It didn't work in Afghanistan. It didn't work in Libya. It hasn't worked in Yemen. It hasn't worked in Somalia. It didn't work in Vietnam. Right? Like We have to internalize this lesson that militaries can destroy things, but it's not their mission. They're not built to, to, to build things. Um, and, and unfortunately, like that is a lesson that, that we're seeing on display in these, in these you know, pretty difficult and tragic uh, images out of Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, no, like I, I agree. I'm not, I'm not criticizing the Biden folks. I don't think there was the political space. I don't think it was in this, our security interest to send thousands more troops to Afghanistan. I mean, wars have to end eventually, or else it's just I, I don't even know what it would be. But yeah, um, just sort of everyone has to prepare ourselves for. I think um, you know the reports out of Afghanistan to be tough uh, for a while, and hopefully you know we can do what we can do diplomatically to help them find better footing. But um, yeah, it's just it's hard to read. Um, Let's take uh, a little pivot here to space, Ben, because there's lots of space news this week, and that's always fun. So first, a Mars orbiter launched by the United Arab Emirates sent back pictures of discrete auroras on Mars. Do you know what those are? It is a, uh, you've heard of the aurora borealis. I've heard of maybe, auroras, listeners. and I know what discrete means, but I don't know what a discrete <laughs> aurora is. So this is so, so the northern lights are the aurora borealis. That's sort of the northern yeah. hemisphere, right? It's when uh, the sun flings charged protons and electrons at the Earth, and the Earth's magnetic field deflects them, and it makes those lights. Mars has a very different magnetic field than the Earth, and it creates a different-looking aurora phenomenon. And the UAE's Hope spacecraft was able to take pictures of it and send them back, so that's very cool. Uh, the second update is more about uh, an intergalactic dick measuring contest between Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, and I guess also Elon Musk. You know, they're all the same sort of thing. So on July 11th, uh, Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson is going to be a passenger on a test suborbital face- space flight, the first one his company does. It means the aircraft is going to reach outer space, but not like escape velocity, like a satellite that would allow it to orbit the globe. Bezos is going to take a trip to suborbital space on his Blue Origin space company ship on July 20th. Uh, the Richard Branson moved up his date. He insists he didn't do it on purpose to screw Bezos, and this isn't a competition between two 
arrogant billionaires. But uh, Bezos' company is also taking shots at Branson because his rocket doesn't go as high in the atmosphere anyway. <laughs> so here's my question for you. Small <laughs> hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where do you land? Where do you land on commercial space flight? Are you ready to hop on on one of these bad boys? Like you have all the money in the world, literally. You're one of these fucking billionaires. And do you do you jump on one of the first space flights just to like show up your Forbes ten? I mean, like patriots. Let's just think about what else these people could be doing with that money. Mm. You know. Here on on planet well, Earth, there's no problems in the world to be right? solved. Exactly, right? Now. right? They, they, they could be investing in democracy. They could be investing in the fight against climate change. They could be investing in the fight against homelessness or inequality. Uh, the inequality, you know, exacerbated by the policies of companies like Amazon, right? Uh, I they mean, could pay more taxes. They could pay some fucking taxes, <laughs> right? Like, they, like instead of uh, like paying zero taxes, right? I mean, I I just think there's something so dystopian about a, a bunch of massive egos having a dick measuring contest to fly up in the atmosphere and do things that, by the way, are not anywhere near what states can do, right? So it's no. not like they're advancing some massive good for humanity by learning about the origins of life on Mars. It's like five minutes of weightlessness. Yes. And they're testing out what it's like to be a passenger. Yeah. I mean, I just don't understand like what, what social good is, is developed by that and, and not you know, to get tarred as, I guess, a socialist spy. But, like, there are certain <laughs> things that, like, governments should do and, and people should not, should actually not be rich enough to do. <laughs> like, 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 the space program should be, like, a, a communal effort, even an, a globally commun communal effort like the International Space Station, a pooling of resources to develop knowledge for the good and benefit of, of humankind, right? Um, I, like, this is not that. You know, yeah, um, I gotta say I, I disagree slightly here because, like, I I think that Elon Musk's company SpaceX is like doing things that are useful. They're delivering satellites. They're delivering supplies to the space station. They're providing like yeah. NASA like okay, services. Fair. This is space tourism, which I guess is cool. But like, one dude I think dropped twenty eight million dollars to get on the first flight. Like, again, talk about someone who needs to be taxed a little bit more. It's that individual. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I, like, okay, so SpaceX is an interesting model because it's this kind of public-private partnership, and it does yeah. try to Subsidized. contribute to things. And and look, I guess if if Richard Branson, who does some good, by the way, does some good stuff, right? Richard Branson has financed like the elders, you know, the the, the Nelson Mandela initiated effort to resolve conflicts. I I, I think there's some good things that he does. Um, Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post. I guess that is. I like the post. Yeah, I like the I'm Washington a subscriber. Post. We're, we're dwelling on the negative here. But that said, like, I, I think you just, it, it's less on them than more just like, like, how does a society have such rampant inequality that this is even a conversation? Like, that's, it's more the structural thing of like, why did we get here? But then also, I think the space tourism thing, it does open up interesting ethical questions because on the one hand, wow, yeah, democratizing space, like people can go to space, that's great. But like, it seems like the barrier to entry is $28 million. Like, uh, if they actually have a plan, I guess here's the thing. If Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson can articulate more concretely how this is benefiting some kind of public good um, and, and how this might be an accessible experience for people who can't spend $28 million, like, then I, you know, there might be more to listen to. Um, but for the time being, like, you know, we most human beings have – like a greater capacity to experience space travel by seeing like a UFO in the sky than hitching a ride on, on the Bezos mobile. I'm cool with, uh, you know, the progress of the technology, just the, the enormous self-regard that goes along with it. It's just, <laughs> it's just too much and the absurd competition. Uh, speaking of competition, let's turn to China because last week, uh, President Xi Jinping delivered a speech celebrating 100 years of the Chinese Communist Party. Many analysts viewed this speech as basically, you know, his stump speech, uh, and that next year they expect him, to, President Xi, to seek a third five-year term as leader, which is a break from his predecessor, Hu Jintao, who served two terms and sort of set that as the expectation for how long one should serve. In his speech, Xi bragged about uh, crushing dissent in Hong Kong, uh, lifting people out of poverty, and basically told the entire international community that China won't listen to any criticism. Here's one quote for you, Ben. Quote, the Chinese people will never allow foreign forces to bully, oppress, or enslave us. Whoever nurses delusions of doing that will crack their heads and spill blood on the Great Wall of Steel built from the flesh and blood of 1.4 billion Chinese people. Very subtle stuff mm. there. Uh, on Taiwan, she said that, quote, 
Nobody should underestimate the staunch determination, firm will, and powerful capacity of the Chinese people to defend national sovereignty and territorial integrity. Ben, anything in the speech surprised you? Any big takeaways generally from, from Xi Jinping and the 100th anniversary event? No, I mean, I, and, and like this, like from having kind of plumbed the depths of the Xi Jinping ideology in working on my book, I mean, this is the direction that he has been going in for some time. You know, and, and here's what I think people have to recognize about it. Like one, like he is a different figure than we have seen, you know, since Mao, really. Um, I mean, in Deng Xiaoping, very strong leader through Tiananmen Square. But then the, the Chinese leaders were the leaders of an autocratic party. But none of them, Hu Jintao, uh, Zheng Zemin, none of them had this kind of cult of personality around them and, and, and were able to change the rules to essentially make themselves indistinguishable from the party. Like Xi is the party, mm -hmm. the party is Xi. There's a kind of cult of personality around him. Like that's a different strain of kind of authoritarianism, totalitarianism than, than we've even seen. And, and it seems to be escalating as things go on. I think the other thing is this kind of determination to reject any foreign criticism whatsoever um, and to define kind of the most maximalist terms for their approach to Hong Kong and Taiwan, let's be clear here, right? China violated an international agreement in Hong Kong. They agreed when their handover took place to Chinese sovereignty that for the next 50 years, there would be one country, two systems. The people of Hong Kong would have their own system. They flagrantly violated that agreement. So this isn't a bunch of foreigners coming in and commenting on their internal affairs. This is a situation where, against the wishes of the people of Hong Kong and that agreement, and frankly, just anybody who cares about human rights in the world, they're just crushing dissent there. And yeah. same thing in Taiwan. Like, there's been agreed upon U.S. policy, a one China policy, but implicit within that was that Taiwan and, and, and mainland China would have to work this out. Um, th them just kind of developing the capacity to crush Taiwan and bend them to their will is not what anybody <laughs> has signed up for either, you know. So he's asking, like, the rest of the world to adjust to basically them being able to do whatever they want with, without any criticism whatsoever. And, and there's no way that the world should adjust to that. Uh, as we've talked about, it, whether that's a, the U.S. government or foreign governments, whether that's companies doing business in China, whether that's civil society, whether that's the entertainment industry, like he's trying to, to brush everybody back to just stay out of our business and let us do whatever we want. And I think the danger of that is if you look at what's happening in the Uyghurs and you look at what's happening in Hong Kong, like a government, a regime that has the capacity to do those things tends to do worse things um, in mm -hmm. other places, whether it's within their own territory, whether it's in Taiwan, or whether it ends up being beyond their borders. So, I mean, like, I, I'm not, I don't want to sign us up for the Cold War. I think if we embrace a kind of a national purpose in opposition to China in the same way we did to terrorism, that can lead to dark places. But that doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't be taking very seriously that this is like, you know, this is not the China of even 20 years ago. This is a much more assertive and, and even aggressive leadership. Yeah, and you, you can see it's freaking out the region. I mean, I saw uh, a couple days ago, or maybe it was today actually, Japan's deputy prime minister said that uh, the country, Japan, might need to defend Taiwan with the United States if the island was invaded, because they're sort of seeing this as, you know, th that could get to a point where their security is threatened and the existence and survival of Japan is threatened. So there's a lot of, I mean, hearing a uh, the Japanese deputy prime minister say something like that that explicitly was was pretty shocking to me. And I in a sign, I think, is of exactly what you just described about how this situation is different. She is different. People are 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 nervous in a way they weren't necessarily before. And one of the things after Xi Jinping came to power is you know the way that the Chinese government had in the past talked about issues like Tibet um, that that they saw as internal affairs. Um, and suddenly the way in which they talked about not just Hong Kong and Taiwan, but even the South China Sea, which extends way beyond any internationally accepted version of China's borders, that began to change too. Uh, and you started to see the Chinese building military structures on distant islands and claiming this whole entire body of water. And so you saw this idea of like their core interests and how they think about their sovereignty extending outward. And that, that has continued. And if you're sitting in Japan and you're thinking, well, I've seen this guy like basically crush dissent in Hong Kong and swallow that up, put a million people in concentration camps. If there's a military invasion of Taiwan that 
kind of goes really easily. You know, they just kind of roll the planes and tanks into to Taiwan and that's it. You know, why wouldn't history suggest that an increasingly nationalist and assertive leadership that is has total disregard for international opinion, why wouldn't history suggest that they might not go further, you know? Or sort of like, you know, com- taking over natural resources and, and things that are not necessarily theirs alone. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of incremental steps that are before, like, war with Japan, but you're right. I mean, it's certainly the history suggests that this, this threat is growing. Um, another important, I think, related story out of China is a pattern we're starting to see of the Chinese government going after Chinese technology companies. So on Sunday, the Chinese government ordered the removal of Didi, which is basically a, an app, it's Uber in China, from its domestic app stores. The government accused Didi of illegally collecting users' personal information in what it called a grave violation of the law and regulation. I guess there were some rumors on Chinese social media sites that Didi had turned over user data to the US government. And this crackdown comes just days after Didi IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange, raised like four and a half billion dollars, the most uh, in an IPO of a Chinese company since Alibaba in 2014. Of course, today the stock is way down. Um, Alibaba is another company we've talked about before. They're basically, you know, often shorthanded as the Amazon of China. And the Chinese government fined them 2.75 billion dollars back in April, uh, and then last year we talked about another incident where Alibaba founder Jack Ma criticized Chinese regulators right before a a planned IPO of a financial services company he runs called uh, the Ant Group. That IPO was blocked by the government. Jack Ma disappeared for several months and just sort of popped up recently uh, in January, I believe. And now he has agreed to allowing the central bank to regulate Ant Financial. So, Ben, one Bloomberg report I saw estimated that the, the blocked Ant Financial IPO meant it lost $70 billion in value in the process, 70 with a B billion. Uh, so again, like the she speech in this story, I think are pieces of the same puzzle, right? Like Jack Ma was this billionaire, powerful person. He criticized the government, slapped down, disappears for months. Uh, Ant Financial, the, this company threatened banks because the, they lended money in a different way. They get slapped down, they get regulated. Like anyone who's threatening she or the Communist Party is getting checked hard. And I guess my question to you is like, I don't know, we're seeing this behavior, right? We're seeing this like aggressive behavior in Hong Kong. We're now seeing this huge risk to corporations that are trying to do business in, in China, even Chinese businesses. Uh, do you think that's gonna wake some of these companies up that we've been talking about, right? Because like the ESPNs of the world, the ABCs, others still seem to be bowing to them and, and, and censoring content and things because they want to get at the Chinese market. But it does seem like Xi Jinping is sending the message that like, I could crush your company. I could suck away $70 billion worth of value, and there's just nothing you could do about it. I mean, I think the basic premise is, what, what, and this is, again, people have to recognize this is somewhat new. Like, I think there's a, the tendency to think, well, they're, they've always been autocratic. Well, but they tolerated some se- somewhat private companies like Alibaba in China that could generate wealth, having some mm-hmm. freedom of, of action and governance. And, of course, they tolerated you know, foreign companies with their own uh, kind of approach to things, although they would, sorry. And they tolerated to some extent foreign companies that had different practices. But what we've seen in the last few years is the Chinese government essentially saying, we are the board of every company that operates in China. That at the end of the day, if you don't do everything we say, and if we don't presumably have access to all your data and and essentially have a, like a, a, a vote, and they actually mandated that, that there be a Chinese Communist Party representative on these boards, um, then you can't do business here. Um, and oh, by the way, uh, if you're a foreign company, you know you're going to have to play by our rules too. Um, and 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 look, this is a, a major shift. And and if you're a U.S. business and you're looking at this, you have to be thinking, what is the direction that this is going, right? Because already the Chinese are, are making no bones about being more intrusive. Uh, and, and people who are investing in China or operating in China. Um, the U.S. government is getting more concerned and is starting to try to put restrictions over whether you can invest in, in Xinjiang province, where obviously you have the Uyghur genocide taking place, or whether U.S. investments can flow to Chinese surveillance technologies or companies that are dominated by the Chinese military. Well, that's a pretty wide swath of companies here. Um, if you're a U.S. tech company, uh, can you 
store your data in China and know that it's secure, right? There, there's so many issues implicated here because the U.S. and Chinese economies are so intermingled. I think the main takeaway we have to, to, to wrestle with here is that the Chinese government has kind of demonstrated and drawn lines and said, anybody doing business here is kind of subject to our control. Um, and what U.S. businesses can still operate in China, uh, obviously some are still going to be operating, but like, where do we draw these lines? You know, this, this word you hear a lot, obviously, decoupling. Mm-hmm. What, what do we not want to be subject to that kind of control? What do we have to protect for national security purposes? Are there supply chains that we need to have be secure, like the pharmaceutical supply chains that allow us to develop vaccines without dependence on, uh, on China? The semiconductors, the, the, you know, those chips that are so essential to everything you use from the computer in your car to your phone that are heavily manufactured in Taiwan. Do we need to be building our own semiconductor industry? So this is a wonky issue, but it is kind of one of the defining issues um, of the next decade. And the Biden team has prioritized this. And I think what you're going to see is, frankly, less and less um, U.S. businesses in China in the same way that they have been in the past. And this kind of disentangling, uh, really, of of certain supply chains, particularly those involved with technology. Yeah, I I think that's exactly right. So, you know, one way the the Biden team is is trying to respond to China is through sanctions. And the Wall Street Journal had an interesting piece today uh, Tuesday about President Biden's plan to rethink and revamp the way the U.S. uses sanctions in an effort to reduce you know, economic damage that can harm average people in a lot of countries and try to ensure that these sanctions are being used in concert with allies and not just unilaterally. So this is part of this broader review. It's supposedly going to be finished uh, near the end of the summer. Um, ben, you know, I think you could argue that sanctions have been overused by <laughs> both Democratic and Republican presidents yeah. in the Trump era, right? They supercharged the use of sanctions, and they often viewed them seemingly as an end of themselves. And you know, guys like Mike Pompeo would brag about how U.S. sanctions were going to destroy the economy in Venezuela or Iran or sort of name your boogeyman country. What do you think the result of this review should be? Like, what do you think the U.S. can or should do to change the way we use sanctions to make it just better, smarter, more effective? I mean, number one, there's just a general overuse, which you know, everybody reaches for sanctions to show that they're doing something that undermines their effectiveness, frankly, undermines like the U.S. being like the the dollar being the reserve currency around the world because people are like, America has all this leverage on these sanctions that they just keep overusing. Maybe we should look for alternatives, whether it's Bitcoin Mm -hmm. or the Chinese currency. That said, when I unpack it, the sanctions I'm most concerned about are the ones where we just kind of pile on sanctions on a country in the hopes that that will change things there. Um, Cuba, Iran, Venezuela, and, and people can start, you know, adding me about like how bad those regimes are. I'm saying, well, what about the results? <laughs> like what has been achieved? Like yeah, what's if changed? you look at the sanctions regime, I mean, Cuba is the most extreme example, like 60 years of just punishing these people and grinding them into extreme poverty. And, and there's nothing, there's no political benefit to it in Cuba. If your goal was to remove the Cuban Communist Party, they're more entrenched. Same thing with Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. Same thing with Iran. So I think no, Ben. In Iran, we got a much, much worse president. Isn't that, is that we a got win? a worse president, <laughs> and they resume their nuclear program when we ratchet back up the sanctions. And so, oh no, that's bad. You're right. Yeah. To, to me, it's like these comprehensive sanctions regimes that we just throw at a country and leave in place forever. That that's the most extreme mm-hmm. overuse. And 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 to admit that to ourselves would to admit that the this is my whole thing on Cuba that the underlying premise of the policy was fundamentally flawed, which is that that isolating a country and just sanctioning them into submission will get them to change. I think where sanctions are important and useful is when you really go after individuals or entities who are responsible for bad things. Um, and and so that's what we've done in Belarus, what we've done with you know Putin circle, what we've done even with some Chinese officials. I actually think those sanctions would have greater weight. If, if it wasn't like the U.S. is just throwing sanctions out the door constantly, right? Yeah, so there's yeah. a place for sanctions to be this targeted tool of, of imp- imposing consequences on people, of marking people as bad actors in the international financial system. But we do ourselves a disservice when, you know, the, uh, we are, are also like there was a, a the Cuban baseball team couldn't travel to a tournament because of sanctions. Like, right, what are we doing right. here, guys? Yeah. Like, uh, and so the overuse as, uh, to punish whole populations is where I would focus this. Couple more stories before we get to some lighter stuff at the end. So, 
the last time I think we probably talked about Lebanon was shortly after that massive explosion in Beirut last August that killed approximately 200 people and just decimated parts of the capital. Now, you know, today, Lebanon is in the midst of a financial crisis that the World Bank says could be among the worst it has seen in nearly 200 years in terms of the impact on just living standards, people's lives. Uh, and Lebanon's currency has lost 90 percent of its value since 2019. So, you know, there's some some great reporting on this recently about residents struggling to find food, medicine, waiting in hours and hours long gasoline lines. Even the richest people in the country are enduring frequent blackouts in you know, super hot weather. Um, Shortly after the explosion happened, the government resigned, the cabinet resigned. But I guess it's just still hanging on there as this caretaker government because the political factions in Lebanon can't agree on a new government to take over. So basically you have the same goons with less power doing less. So it's even worse. Lots of people are leaving the country. I mean, Ben, I know, like, again, Biden's got a ton on his plate. He's got COVID. He's got a billion things. But uh, have you seen any discussions, conversations, anything helpful about what the international community could or should be doing to assist with Lebanon right now and help it from prevent it from completely collapsing. I know there had been talk about maybe some sort of loan, but that was contingent on, you know, a government change, some some reforms, preventing corruption. I just I, I don't know where that is at this point. I think that there's this always this chicken and egg situation in these circumstances where like the stabilization packages that come from, you know, the IMF or the World Bank or yeah. international lending institutions are so onerous. They require, you know, massive rises in prices and, you know, restructuring of the economy that, that it's no coincidence that nobody wants to be in the new government um, right. to accede to that kind of thing. But that right. said, the international community is also right to say, well, we don't want to just shove a bunch of money into a bunch of incredibly corrupt people who will spend the money and make no changes to try to improve the circumstance. And so it leads to this kind of stalemate. But here's how I look at this. Like, the situation is so dire. And I think the reality is that Lebanon has had to shoulder the burden of a lot of shit that, you know, when you look at a million refugees living there, you look at how they've been impacted by the proxy war in their own country, but surrounding them. I think that the the ante is a little higher on the international community to not just come in with like the traditional package that says you know you have to take all this medicine and 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 and, and, yeah. and you know I think there has to be a little bit more incentive here um, and a little more just assistance um, to to kind of help meet some of the basic needs in the country. I obviously, should be attached to efforts to try to reduce corruption and and establish some kind of technocratic governing entity that can can get beyond this mixture of sectarian politics and corruption that's paralyzed the country. I, I'd say that I, it's not easy, but to no. me that like that, I think that there should be a little bit more generosity in terms of how the world is looking at this um, and, and a concerted effort to try to not win some sectarian competition in the composition next government, but like let get some people in there who can just kind of have some technocratic expertise to stabilize things, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's been like, what, 10 months basically since a, a near nuclear explosion in the capital of this country. And God, it's just clearly not nearly enough has been done to help them uh, get back on their feet. Um, here's an idea for a country that could cut a big check, Ben, Saudi Arabia. So uh, according yeah. to the Associated Press on Tuesday, the Biden administration hosted a delegation from Saudi Arabia That included one of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's brothers. I think he's the deputy defense minister. So these talks were mostly with leaders at the Pentagon. Uh, The Saudi delegation also met with uh, Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, a bunch of others at the State Department. Topics reportedly included the war in Yemen uh, and the Iran nuclear deal. This was the highest level Saudi visit since the intelligence community released its report into the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi by the Saudi government uh, at at the behest of uh, Mohammed bin Salman or MBS. So, Ben, you know, I think you and I had a very similar initial reaction to this news, which was not announced. It just sort of was reported out, which is just gross. Yeah. Gross, shitty, shitty, gross people. Um, But I also understand that, you know, we have to work with the Saudis on a bunch of important stuff. What do you make of this meeting too soon? Uh, has to happen. Like, I don't know, if you're in government and you're just, you know, being pushed into some sort of like real politic mindset, like wh- where does this land? I just look, Tommy, I, I continue to come down that like, I can't, you know, write a book like I just wrote about democracy basically being <laughs> receding everywhere 
this kind of rising tide of authoritarianism and, and, and America's you know, diminished credibility in speaking up for democracy, I just don't think you can do this and say that you know, we're back, we're promoting democracy. I, I, you know, it's hard, I get, look, I, I'm, I'm sure the Biden people might say, hey Ben, what about Lebanon? You're just talking about this, these Saudis can write big checks for Lebanon, we gotta talk to them, get them to do, I get that. But at a certain point, like, you just have to say like, because this guy's MBS's brother, very close advisor, like this is basically the closest thing to having MBS, you know, in the yeah. country. Um, I wouldn't do it. Um, and if you have to talk to him, you can talk to him. You can send someone, you know, a diplomat to Riyadh. Like it just conveys a sense of of a gradual normalization um, of of the Saudi government and governing family. Let's keep in mind this is a group of people um, that that violated the most basic human right possible, the right to be alive in a third country uh, with an opinion, you know? And, yeah. and at the same time that we're saying we all have to sanction uh, Belarus over diverting an airliner to silence a critic, to have the people that silence a critic in Washington, it just undercuts that message. And I'm sympathetic to, to how hard this is, but I just think at a certain point, give yourself the clarity of saying like, you know what, we're, we're for democracy and there's just a higher threshold for who we engage um, because we recognize it sends a message to the world. So yeah. uh, again, I'm sure they're doing, you know, they're, they're trying to get them to end the war in Yemen and, and to, to contribute on Lebanon and what have you. But um, frankly, they should be doing that like anyway, it, they shouldn't be doing that as a favor to us. And uh, we, they can't do the war in Yemen without us. Uh, I think like drawing, you know, drawing some lines with these folks is, is ultimately going to be, more effective in the long run anyway, even if it creates uh, a lot of problems in the short run. Yeah, maybe do this one via Skype. I don't know. What, yeah, what do I know? Yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've been out of government a long time. Put it uh, this way. If you can't me. announce the meeting, it's a bit of a tell that maybe, you know, like... Uh, yeah, 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 that kind of jumped out of me too. Okay, some Olympic stuff. Olympic grab bag here. So, uh, one story that caught my eye. Bloomberg had a piece about how unbelievably difficult it is for a lot of the athletes to get to Japan for the the games this year because of COVID restrictions uh, and airline yeah, schedules yeah. generally. Did you see this? So yeah. the athletes from Fiji had to fly on a cargo plane that normally transports seafood. That was the only way they could get there. Some teams had to fly literally thousands of miles in the wrong direction because the cities where they would normally connect won't allow them in because their countries have uh, high COVID cases. There have been some incidents of athletes testing positive for coronavirus after they get to Japan. So uh, just really rough on these athletes. It sucks. We feel for them. Also, maybe just as exhausting as the game's been is the impending conversation about efforts to censor protests at the Olympics. Uh. So the rules are a little, they're hard to follow this year. The U.S. Olympic Committee said it will not punish protests or speech at the Olympics as long as it's not attacking or targeting a group. The IOC says you can express your views before or after competition, but not during events, not during victory ceremonies, or at the Olympic Village. So you really don't have freedom to protest. Um, already we are seeing right-wing idiots making up reasons to be mad. Today it was our old friend Rick Grinnell uh, and a bunch of his buddies trying to claim that some members of the U.S. women's soccer team turned away from a veteran who was playing uh, the national anthem on a harmonica, I believe. It turns out the women on the U.S. soccer team turned to face the American flag, which is what I, I assume Rick That's Grinnell what would want. To do. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like th this is just the perfect example, right, of how these are right-wing trolls who want to be mad about something, and there's no facts can change that. Any thoughts on how we all can prevent these assholes from, like, politicizing the sports we love and just, you know, like, tune them out, these bad faith criticisms, et cetera? No. Uh, <laughs> <'cause>, <laughs> yeah, I don't uh, either. Uh, I got uh, nothing. Uh, well, I, I guess what I've got is that, like, can we just be like fucking into our athletes? Like, I know. You know, we went this when the U.S. women's team won the Soccer World Cup, and it's like, I I thought the patriotic thing used to be like rooting for your people and being excited when they win, not like demanding that they align complete with. with the, look, there are gonna be some athletes who win who don't agree with my politics. Like, I'll be glad like that America won some competition. Like, I, like the idea that you know, you're going to apply this kind of Rick Grinnell test to athletes who, by the way, like, 
and I've thought a lot about this time. Like the creative athletes and creative people, like, like they, they, they're, they're not like by and large MAGA types because the kind of like free thinking and innovation and creativity that it takes to excel as an athlete in a lot of sports. And certainly as a, as a creator, like doesn't lend itself to being like, you know, some MAGA disciple, like just fucking deal with that. I mean, uh, like it's it's like it's like these people are still mad that they weren't like athletes in high school or something, and and they're like they're taking it out I on know. the world, you know? Like like just just leave us alone. I mean, I I this is a different one, but like their search for this is 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 what is so insane. Like yeah. I saw some controversy on Fox recently. Like Macy Gray had said we need like a new flag or something. I haven't thought about Macy Gray in about fifteen years, you know? But like they'll just take any athlete. Like yeah, they they're not like. I mean, it's kind of fascistic. Like, like these yeah. athletes are, are are not like robotically, you know, genuflecting before the flag sufficiently, so we will cancel them. Like, it's kind of very un-American. I'm glad the U.S. Olympic Committee changed its rules to allow for protests. That's obviously the American thing to do. I think the IOC is stupid. Obviously, the uh, the substance abuse rules are ridiculous. The fact that testing positive for marijuana can get you thrown out of the Olympics is possibly the, the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But yeah, it is just a good reminder that there's going to be a bunch of right wingers who want to politicize sports, who want to tell mostly black athletes how or when they can say what they want to say and that they are trolls. They don't care about the facts. I, I think we're probably going to have to, I don't think we can shut them down. So we might have to tune them out and just support these athletes uh, when they need us because, you know, Fox and friends is going to try to waste your time and, and be, pull you into a conversation that's about their version of America and accepting all the things they believe. And it's just, it's not how the country works. Well, and ask yourself why these protests are happening in the first place. Like the Olympics have been going on for a long time. Like there's a reason there's more protests now because there's more to be upset about. (laughs) There's more injustice, there's more inequality, there's more racial injustice. And athletes are reflective of the society in that regard. I do think, Tommy, it's like important that we get the back of the athletes that they yeah, get kind of canceled the by the right, because yep. you know, as as you know, as much as I would like these things to be resolved through kind of uh, like just the the competition of democracy, the reality is the right is going to try to impose an economic cost on athletes who express themselves and deny them a following, deny them sponsorship deals, and frankly, I think it's important as was done with like Megan Rapinoe, that the rest of us like lift up that athlete and say, no, actually, like well, you have an audience, you have people who have your back because then that allows other athletes to be confident that they're not going to lose their whole career by saying what they think. So it may yeah. sound like un- unappetizing that it's kind of a capitalist way of, of supporting athletes, but, but it, I, I do think it's just we need to send a signal that, that people can't get canceled for protesting. Yeah, I agree for, for just talking about what you believe. Uh, okay. In a, in a more fun vein, then, I just I went through the entire list on the TeamUSA.org website today and just pulled out three athletes just for fun. I'm going to tell you about them, and we all can just find them and root for them whenever they come on the TV. I know nothing about their beliefs. They just seem cool to me. So uh, here's one. Lex Gillette. He's from North Carolina. We got me with the name. You got me with the name. Badass name. Competing in the long jump in the Paralympic Games. He is the best totally blind long jumper and triple jumper in the history of the U.S. Paralympics. He's the current world record holder in the long jump where he jumped 22 feet. 22 feet. Fucking incredible. Uh, Here's another one to remember, another name to remember. Vashti Cunningham. Uh, She is from Las Vegas, Nevada. She competed in Rio in 2016, uh, and that's her one time in the Olympics. You might have heard of her dad, who was Randall Cunningham, Ooh. an absolutely Whoa. badass Whoa. Yes. NFL quarterback. Yeah, the, the family is just obscenely athletic. Yeah. Uh, she's competing in the high jump, if I forgot to say that, from Bishop Gorman High School in Las Vegas. So that is the name I will watch. Last one, Anita Alvarez. I did it alphabetically then. She was the first one I saw. She's from Kenmore, New York, competing as a synchronized swimmer. Uh, her bio on the Team USA site, Includes the fact that she stepped on Michelle Obama's foot during a White House visit. So we wanted to give her a shout out and let her know that I'm sure Michelle was cool with that. Uh, Anita, we are rooting for you here on Pod Save the World. So tweet at us. We want to hear more about you. And if, you, if folks out there have any athletes they want to nominate, I went all Team USA today. But if there, there's uh, athletes from around the world they want to talk about, nominate to get talked about, let us know. And just remind yourself that like one of the cool things about learning all these athlete stories is like, they come from all these different places that you don't know. You learn about places. You learn about 
different experiences or people having in the country. It's one of the things that knits together like a sense of national identity because these people like America, like are made up of incredible differences, which is very cool. And then globally, you learn the story of these athletes. I want someone to make the documentary about the Fiji team that had to fly on the cargo plane. You know, yeah. like, uh, it's just a great way to learn about your fellow human beings. You know, that's why yeah. I love the Olympics. Totally. Lex Gillette, Vashti Cunningham, Anita Alvarez, Pod Save the World stamp of approval. <laughs> We're excited to watch Blind, it I mean, to, 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 to be, to excel like at something like that, um, you know, without your eyesight, like a yeah. You know, I, so I was reading about him. I, I guess you know he started to have sort of a deterioration in his eyes at about age eight. Had ten surgeries, and over time became fully blind, and just sort of like learned to compete, practice, train in all these events by sort of I think having a parent sort of like coach you with sound about where to where to run and how to you know sort of correct yourself if you veer off course. I mean, it's just an unbelievable thing to adapt to be able to do and ultimately jump 22 feet in the air uh just astounding so anyway excited about the olympics uh i can't wait to watch the games thanks to all the people who lit off fireworks before 11 p.m a little less <laughs> yeah, yeah. with all the people who lit them up <laughs> after 11 p.m you know preferably don't do it near a uh a, a tinder box of a palm tree saw a couple of videos of those not good a little too dry my, out here ben my grandfather uh, who was like, you know, uh, like a New York Jewish, hard living, fun guy. Um, he had like a, a saying in life um, that, uh, and he was talking about two in the morning, which is much later than 11 p.m. But he was always like, if you can't get it done by two in the morning, you shouldn't be out anymore. You know, um, you can adjust that a little earlier. You probably adjust it to midnight, but it's a pretty good rule to live by. There's a certain point where if like you have not achieved the goal of the evening, whether it involved fireworks or ingesting substances or whatever it is, um, uh, you know, falling in love, uh, to put it uh, gently, like it's time to go home, you know. And so Work. if the people in Venice who were putting off fireworks at three o'clock in the morning, if you hadn't if you hadn't gotten that done by midnight, like you should probably just not do it. If you hadn't gotten your fill of explosions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Words to live by 2 a.m. I like that. Uh, that's it for the show this week. Talk to you guys next week.